Faith and Knowledge by J. Gresham Machen The question, what is faith, which forms the subject of the following discussion, may seem to some persons impertinent and unnecessary. Faith, it may be said, cannot be known except by experience, and when it is known by experience, logical analysis of it and logical separation of it from other experience will only serve to destroy its power and its charm. The man who knows by experience what it is to trust Christ, for example, to rest upon him for salvation, will never need, it may be held, to engage in psychological investigations of that experience which is the basis of his life, and indeed such investigations may even serve to destroy the thing that is to be investigated. Such objections are only one manifestation of a tendency that is very widespread at the present day, the tendency to disparage the intellectual aspect of the religious life. Religion, it is held, is an ineffable experience. The intellectual expression of it can be symbolical merely. The most various opinions in the religious sphere are compatible with a fundamental unity of life. Theology may vary, and yet religion may remain the same. Obviously, this temper of mind is hostile to precise definitions. Indeed, nothing makes a man more unpopular in the controversies of the present day than an insistence upon definition of terms. Anything, it seems, may be forgiven more readily than that. Men discourse very eloquently today upon such subjects as God, religion, Christianity, atonement, redemption, faith, but are greatly incensed when they are asked to tell in simple language what they mean by these terms. They do not like to have the flow of their eloquence checked by so vulgar a thing as a definition. And so they will probably be incensed by the question which forms the title of the present book in the midst of eloquent celebrations of faith, usually faith contrasted with knowledge. It seems disconcerting to be asked what faith is. This anti-intellectual tendency in the modern world is no trifling thing. It has its roots deep in the entire philosophical development of modern times. Modern philosophy, since the days of Kant, with the theology that has been influenced by it, has had as its dominant note, certainly as its present-day result, a depreciation of the reason and a skeptical answer to Pilate's question, what is truth? This attack upon the intellect has been conducted by men of marked intellectual power, but an attack upon the intellect it has been all the same, and at last the logical results of it, even in the sphere of practice, are beginning to appear. A marked characteristic of the present day is a lamentable intellectual decline, which has appeared in all fields of human endeavor except those that deal with purely material things. The intellect has been browbeaten so long in theory that one cannot be surprised if it is now ceasing to function in practice. Schleiermacher and Ritchell, despite their own intellectual gifts, have, it may be fairly maintained, contributed largely to produce that indolent impressionism which, for example in the field of New Testament studies, has largely taken the place of the patient researches of a generation or so ago. The intellectual decadence of the day is not limited to the church or to the subject of religion, but appears in secular education as well. Sometimes it is assisted by absurd pedagogic theories, which, whatever their variety in detail, are alike in their depreciation of the labor of learning facts. Facts in the sphere of education are having a hard time. The old-fashioned notion of reading a book and hearing a lecture and simply storing up in the mind what the book or the lecture contains, this is regarded as entirely out of date. A year or so ago, I heard a noted educator give some advice to a company of college professors, advice which was typical of the present tendency in education. It is a great mistake, he said, in effect, to suppose that a college professor ought to teach. On the contrary, he ought simply to give the students an opportunity to learn. This pedagogic theory of following the line of least resistance in education and avoiding all drudgery and all hard work has been having its natural result. 
It has joined forces with the natural indolence of youth to produce in present-day education a very lamentable decline. The decline has not indeed been universal. In the sphere of the physical sciences, for example, the acquisition of facts is not regarded as altogether out of date. Indeed, the anti-intellectualistic tendency in religion and in those subjects that deal specifically with the things of the spirit has been due, partly at least, to a monopolistic possession of the intellect on the part of the physical sciences and the, of their utilitarian applications. But in the long run, it is to be questioned whether even those branches of endeavor will profit by their monopolistic claims— in the long run, the intellect will hardly profit by being excluded from the higher interests of the human spirit, and its decadence may then appear even in the material sphere. But, however that may be, whether or not intellectual decadence has already extended or will soon extend to the physical sciences, its prevalence in other spheres, in literature and history, for example, and still more clearly in the study of language, is perfectly plain. An outstanding feature of contemporary education in these spheres is the growth of ignorance. Pedagogic theory and the growth of ignorance have gone hand in hand. The undergraduate student of the present day is being told that he need not take notes on what he hears in class, that the exercise of the memory is a rather childish and mechanical thing, and that what he is really in college to do is to think for himself and to unify his world. He usually makes a poor business of unifying his world, and the reason is clear. He does not succeed in unifying his world for the simple reason that he has no world to unify. He has not acquired a knowledge of a sufficient number of facts in order to even learn the method of putting facts together. He's being told to practice the business of mental digestion, but the trouble is that he has no food to digest. The modern student, contrary to what is often said, is really being starved for want of facts. Certainly we are not discouraging originality. On the contrary, we desire to encourage it in every possible way, and we believe that the encouragement of it will be of immense benefit to the spread of the Christian religion. The trouble with the university students of the present day, from the point of view of evangelical Christianity, is not that they are too original, but that they are not half original enough. They go on in the same routine way, following their leaders like a flock of sheep, repeating the same stock phrases with little knowledge of what they mean, swallowing whole whatever professors choose to give them, and all the time imagining that they are bold, bad, independent young men merely because they abuse what everybody else is abusing, namely, the religion that is founded upon Christ. It is popular today to abuse that unpopular thing that is known as supernatural Christianity, but original it certainly is not. A true originality might bring some resistance to the current of the age, some willingness to be unpopular, and some independent scrutiny, at least if not acceptance, of the claims of Christ. If there is one thing more than another which we believers in historic Christianity ought to encourage in the youth of our day, it is independence of mind. It is a great mistake, then, to suppose that we who are called conservatives hold desperately to certain beliefs merely because they are old and are opposed to the discovery of new facts. On the contrary, we welcome new discoveries with all our hearts, and we believe that our cause will come to its rights again only when youth throws off its present intellectual lethargy, refuses to go thoughtlessly with the anti-intellectual current of the age, and recovers some genuine independence of mind. In one sense, indeed, we are traditionalists. We do maintain that any institution that is really great has its roots in the past. We do not, therefore, desire to substitute modern sects for the historic Christian church. But on the whole, in view of the conditions that now exist, it would perhaps be more correct to call us radicals than to call us conservatives. 
we look not for a mere continuation of spiritual conditions that now exist, but for an outburst of new power. We are seeking in particular to arouse youth from its present uncritical repetition of current phrases into some genuine examination of the basis of life, and we believe that Christianity flourishes not in the darkness, but in the light. A revival of the Christian religion, we believe, will deliver mankind from its present bondage and, like the great revival of the 16th century, will bring liberty to mankind. Such a revival will not be the work of man, but the work of the Spirit of God. But one of the means which the Spirit will use, we believe, is an awakening of the intellect. The retrograde anti-intellectual movement called modernism, a movement which really degrades the intellect by excluding it from the sphere of religion, will be overcome, and thinking will again come to its rights. The new reformation, in other words, will be accompanied by a new renaissance. And the last thing in the world that we desire to do is to discourage originality or independence of mind. But what we do insist upon is that the right to originality has to be earned, and that it cannot be earned by ignorance or by indolence. A man cannot be original in his treatment of a subject unless he knows what the subject is. True originality is preceded by patient attention to the facts. It is that patient attention to the facts which, in application of modern pedagogic theory, is being neglected by the youth of the present day. In our insistence upon mastery of facts in education, we are sometimes charged with the desire of forcing our opinions ready-made upon our students. We professors get up behind our professorial desks, it is said, and proceed to lecture. The helpless students are expected not only to listen, but to take notes. Then they are expected to memorize what we have said, with all our firstlies and secondlies and thirdlies, and finally they are expected to give it all back to us in the examination. Such a system, so the charge runs, stifles all originality and all life. Instead, the modern pedagogical expert comes with a message of hope. Instead of memorizing facts, he says, true education consists in learning to think. Drudgery is a thing of the past, and self-expression is to take its place. In such a charge, there may be an element of truth. Possibly there was a time in education when memory was overestimated and thinking was deprived of its rights. But if the education of the past was one-sided in its emphasis upon acquaintance with facts, surely the pendulum is now swung to the opposite extreme, which is more disastrous still. It is a travesty upon our pedagogic method when we are represented as regarding a mere storing up of lectures in the mind of the student as an end in itself. In point of fact, we regard it as a means to an end, but a very necessary means. We regard it not as a substitute for independent thinking, but as a necessary prerequisite for it. The student who accepts what we say without criticism and without thinking of his own is no doubt very unsatisfactory, but equally unsatisfactory is the student who undertakes to criticize what he knows nothing whatever about. Thinking cannot be carried on without the materials of thought, and the materials of thought are facts, or else assertions that are presented as facts. A mass of details stored up in the mind does not in itself make a thinker, but, on the other hand, thinking is absolutely impossible without that mass of details. And it is just this latter impossible operation of thinking without the materials of thought which is being advocated by modern pedagogy and is being put into practice only too well by modern students. In the presence of this tendency, we believe that facts and hard work ought again to be allowed to come to their rights. It is impossible to think with an empty mind. If the growth of ignorance is lamentable in secular education, it is tenfold worse in the sphere of the Christian religion and in the sphere of the Bible. Bible classes today often avoid a study of the actual contents of the Bible as they would avoid pestilence or disease. To many persons in the church, the notion of getting the simple historical contents of the Bible straight in the mind is an entirely new idea. 
When one is asked to preach at a church, the pastor sometimes asks the visiting preacher to conduct his Bible class, and sometimes he gives a hint as to how the class is ordinarily conducted. He makes it very practical, he says. He gives the class hints as to how to live during the following week. But when I, for my part, actually conduct such a class, I most emphatically do not give the members hints as to how to live during the following week. That is not because such hints are not useful, but because they are not all that is useful. It would be very sad if a Bible class did not get practical directions, but a class that gets nothing but practical directions is very poorly prepared for life. And so when I conduct the class, I try to give them what they do not get on other occasions. I try to help them get straight in their minds the doctrinal and historical contents of the Christian religion. The absence of doctrinal teaching and preaching is certainly one of the causes for the present lamentable ignorance in the church, but a still more influential cause is found in the failure of the most important of all Christian educational institutions. The most important Christian educational institution is not the pulpit or the school, important as these institutions are, it is the Christian family. And that institution has, to a very large extent, ceased to do its work. Where did those of us who have reached middle life really get our knowledge of the Bible? I suppose my experience is the same as that of a good many of us. I did not get my knowledge of the Bible from Sunday school or from any other school, but I got it on Sunday afternoons with my mother at home. And I will venture to say that although my mental ability was certainly of no extraordinary kind, I had a better knowledge of the Bible at 14 years of age than is possessed by many students in the theological seminaries of the present day. Theological students come for the most part from Christian homes. Indeed, in very considerable proportion, they are children of the manse. Yet when they have finished college and enter the theological seminary, many of them are quite ignorant of the simple contents of the English Bible. The sad thing is that it is not chiefly the student's fault. These students, many of them, are sons of ministers, and by their deficiencies they reveal the fact that the ministers of the present day are not only substituting exhortation for instruction and ethics for theology in their preaching, but are even neglecting the education of their own children. The lamentable fact is that the Christian home as an educational institution has largely ceased to function. Certainly that fact serves to explain to a considerable extent the growth of ignorance in the church. But the explanation itself requires an explanation. So far we have only succeeded in pushing the problem farther back. The ignorance of the church is explained by the failure of the Christian family as an educational institution, but what in turn explains that failure? Why is it that Christian parents have neglected the instruction of their children? Why is it that preaching has ceased to be educational and doctrinal? Why is it that even Sunday schools and Bible classes have come to consider solely applications of Christianity without studying the Christianity that is to be applied? These questions take us to the very heart of the situation. The growth of ignorance in the church, the growth of indifference with regard to the simple facts recorded in the Bible, all goes back to a great spiritual movement, really skeptical in its tendency, which has been going forward during the last 100 years, a movement which appears not only in philosophers and theologians such as Kant and Schleiermacher and Ritchell, but also in a widespread attitude of plain men and women throughout the world. The depreciation of the intellect, with the exaltation in the place of it of the feelings or of the will, is, we think, a basic fact in modern life which is rapidly leading to a condition in which men neither know anything nor care anything about the doctrinal content of the Christian religion, in which there is in general a lamentable intellectual decline. This intellectual decline is certainly not appearing exclusively among persons who are trying to be evangelical in their views about the Bible. It is at least equally manifest among those who hold the opposing view, 
A striking feature of recent religious literature is the abandonment of scientific historical method, even among those who regard themselves as in the van of scientific progress. Scientific historical method in the interpretation of the Bible requires that the biblical writers should be allowed to speak for themselves. A generation or so ago, that feature of scientific method was exalted to the dignity of a principle and was honored by a long name. It was called grammatico-historical exegesis. The fundamental notion of it was that the modern student should distinguish sharply between what he would have said or what he would have liked to have the biblical writer say and what the writer actually did say. The latter question only was regarded as forming the subject matter of exegesis. This principle, in America at least, is rapidly being abandoned. It is not indeed being abandoned in theory. Lip service is still being paid to it. But it is being abandoned in fact. It is being abandoned by the most eminent scholars. It is abandoned by Professor Goodspeed, for example, when in his translation of the New Testament he translates the Greek word meaning justify in important passages by make upright. I confess that it is not without regret that I should see the doctrine of justification by faith, which is the foundation of evangelical liberty, thus removed from the New Testament. It is not without regret that I should abandon the whole of the Reformation and return with Professor Goodspeed to the merit religion of the Middle Ages. But the point that I am now making is not that Professor Goodspeed's translation is unfortunate because it involves, as it certainly does, religious retrogression, but because it involves an abandonment of historical method in exegesis. It may well be that this question, how a sinful man may become right with God, does not interest the modern translator. But every true historian must certainly admit that it did interest the Apostle Paul. And the translator of Paul must, if he be true to his trust, place the emphasis where Paul placed it and not where the translator would have wished it placed. What is true in the case of Paul is also true in the case of Jesus. Modern writers have abandoned the historical method of approach. They persist in confusing the question what they could have wished that Jesus had been with the question what Jesus actually was. In reading one of the most popular recent books on the subject of religion, I came upon the following amazing assertion. Jesus, the author says, concerned himself but little with the question of existence after death, unquote. In the presence of such assertions, any student of history may well stand aghast. It may be that we do not make much of the doctrine of a future life, but the question whether Jesus did so is not a matter of taste, but an historical question which can be answered only on the basis of an examination of the sources of historical information that we call the Gospels. And the result of such examination is perfectly plain. As a matter of fact, not only the thought of heaven, but also the thought of hell runs all through the teaching of Jesus. It appears in all four of the Gospels. It appears in the sources, supposed to underlie the Gospels, which have been reconstructed, rightly or wrongly, by modern criticism. It imparts to the ethical teaching its peculiar earnestness. It is not an element which can be removed by any critical process, but simply suffuses the whole of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' life. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. These words are not an excrescence in Jesus' teaching, but are quite at the center of the whole. At any rate, if you are going to remove the thought of a future life from the teaching of Jesus, if at this point you are going to reject the prima facie evidence, surely you could do so only by a critical grounding of your procedure. And my point is that critical grounding is now thought to be quite unnecessary. 
Modern American writers simply attribute their own predilections to Jesus without, apparently, the slightest scrutiny of the facts. As over against this anti-intellectual tendency in the modern world, it will be one chief purpose of the present little book to defend the primacy of the intellect and, in particular, to try to break down the false and disastrous opposition which has been set up between knowledge and faith. Chapter 1 of J. Gresham Machen's Education, Christianity, and the States.